devastated. You, you saw lots of the ocean floor, and then all of a sudden the tsunami came back and struck killing hundreds of thousands. We start, ironically, in a vacation paradise that became a hell on Earth. Indonesia has been like a second home for me. When I saw the footage of the tsunami, it was painful because I've spent so many years living there. Watching these images made me realize the impact it had on the world. The perfect waves is what brought me here. My name is Timmy Turner. Ever since I came here for the first time and rode these incredible waves, I was hooked. As time went on, I fell in love with the kids and the people. I spend months out of time in the cities, hanging out and living their lifestyle. The rest of the time, I would spend exploring remote islands and find uncrowded surf. We'd camp out and wait for the swells to hit. And once it did, it was amazing. This led us to being exposed on the cover of Surfer Magazine. I bring a video camera with me and document our adventures, and this has led me into three films now. This country has been so good to me, the least I could do is get over there and find some way to help. You want to hear Timmy's plan? Yeah. He wants to go to Indo. He wants to go to the place that it happened. He's being, he's got a big heart for wanting to go, but he's got a family here that's... What are you going to do, Timmy? You're not going to be able to do anything except get video footage. Yeah. And then you're going to bring it back here, and what are you going to do with it? You can maybe and put it in your movies? No. And make Daddy! A fundraiser. No, you can make a fundraiser by yourself. Well, I need, I need the footage. No, you don't. What are you, who are you going to show it to? CNN. Yeah, Timmy. It's, you don't think CNN has enough of that stuff? You no, know, it's all fake. No, it's not fake? They don't have the real stuff. Timmy, the that story. that was Indo. They don't live with those Indos. I'll go live with the Indos. No, you're well, not. You have us to live with. Every 10 days. Timmy, shut up. Well, you're ridiculous right now. Go call your dad and see what your dad says. Uh, pretty terrific. <laughs> I mean, horrific. But go over there and do what you can do. You can just go over there and give some moral support and some manual labor. I mean, you know, it's... It's such a disaster. I mean, it's just like, wow. We got to do this, Timmy. This is what our lives are telling us to do right now. Every Dustin Humphrey, my longtime best friend, has been traveling to Indo with me since day one. He's a photographer. He has the same love and passion for this country as I do. It was Dustin and his Indonesian wife, Mira, who called me and said, Let's get over there and do something. Nias, just yesterday they can reach Nias in the western part of Aceh. Malabo and everything, they just can reach it yesterday. It's thousands died. Are you in with me or not, Dad? Yeah, I want you in with me. There's yeah. nobody else in the world I want to go with me. Just got off the phone with my sponsor, Quicksilver. It sounds like we're on the boat with SurfAid documenting their relief efforts. My mom owns a restaurant in Huntington Beach called The Sugar Shack. The devastation of the tsunami affected her in the same way as it did for me. She decided that she wanted to come with us on our mission. My mom is like Mother Teresa in a way. She often feeds the homeless and helps everyone out who comes into the restaurant. I mean, if that happened to one of my children and my kids, I would want somebody to help me. So that was like my grandchildren or my just, I just think it's something we have to do. The day we are departing, Dust and I picked up a satellite phone from Quicksilver. The satellite would allow us to send back photos and daily field reports on what was going down. He got his Christmas money for his new surfboard and he said, Dad, I want to give this to Timmy to take to some family over there to help him. Here's his money for you. To take it over to those people. And then here's some more money from us. All right. So, have a safe trip, brother. Yeah, thanks. Peace. All right. Tell Daddy. Love you. Love you. Say, I'm going to miss you. Me too. We 
We all arrived in Padang to document yeah. surf aid and the tsunami relief efforts. Our main purpose was to take photos, video, and help out in any way we could. We're going to the hotel and we're going to figure out what is really going on. We're here and we don't know what to do. Um, basically, SurfAids told us that they, they don't have room for us, um, that their boats are full and there aren't any other boats available in their fleet. So we found out that we couldn't get on the surf aid boat because we were in the way of the crew and their medical team. So it happened out that there was three other surf journalists staying out at a hotel and they weren't able to get on the boat either. We had Dave Sparks, a photographer from Tracks Magazine. Bill Sharp from Billabong. And Matt George from Surfer Magazine. We all kind of came together and formed our own group. This operation in the last uh, little over 48 hours has evolved from what was expected to be a, n a number of surf media photographers, journalists, and things of that nature coming here to cover um, a particular relief effort. What it has become now is that team of surf media individuals banding together um, to form a very effective unit to um, put on an additional relief um, efforts for the people of northern Sumatra. What we decided to do as a group was to uh, begin our own operation, and we call ourselves the Sumatra Surf Zone Relief Operation. We had our first meeting and chose our jobs for each person in the group. Can somebody with no experience take food and water out there and start giving it to people? What if there's just people out there dying? I had my ups and downs thinking about if I should be doing this or not. But in my heart, kept telling me that, um, that I, I got to do it. And are we going to look at all this on our way? Our team has been going so strong. They've been on the phone nonstop for three days, just organizing and trying to find funds and trying to find a way to go out there and help. And we pretty much came up with a plan. We're chartering a boat now, and we're just going to go out there and find some villages that haven't been helped yet. This boat is uh, going to quickly become Noah's Ark. But we want to be able to show up and bring to shore water, food, doctors. Doctors? We have three doctors. So we had a meeting with three Indonesian doctors. Vaccination, Vaccination. shots for typhoid, you know, cholera, measles, uh, hepatitis. Uh, all, do you have those? We, we, I, I do have hepatitis, typhoid, and heart. Do you have a facility at your hospital where members of our team could go and get them? Of course. <laughs> After we explained our mission to them, they quickly accepted the job. They began with our vaccinations so that we wouldn't get sick. <laughs> oh, that feels kind of good. Whatever the plan is this morning, by this afternoon, it will have changed, and by tonight it'll be completely different. But you have to be ready to set aside your Western high speed, get this done, immediate gratification mindset, and get in tune with how things operate in this part of the world. Plans change every hour, but we finally have a good plan. and. Everything's coming together right now. Right now, we hired this big truck to uh, load up this with buckets. The buckets were donated to us by another relief organization called IDEP. Our plan was to bring 37 tons of supplies as close to the epicenter as possible. We are uh, currently loading these rescue kits. They contain uh, basically everything that a family needs for infrastructure to um, rebuild a family. Fishing gear, uh, tools, uh, lamp oil, a lamp, candles, the basic first aid, water. Um, and they're designed like this so that they're easy to transport and that they're waterproof. So uh, the theory is you might be even able to just throw these into the surf line and let them wash up on shore. We worked all day long loading a thousand buckets into the truck.
We then drove the truck across town to our boat called the Makumba. We just formed this crew that's been able to, from a management standpoint, get together and solve all these needs and work as a, as a team through some incredible logistical difficulties to obtain the vessels to procure all these supplies to set up immediate lines of communication with all the relief organizations here on the ground and it's just and all that's happened in, in 48 hours. We're, um, we're loading up the boat with uh, the rest of our supplies, everything from crowns and books for kids to cooking oil and food and water. Michelle and I, we figured out where we have to load in everything and we make sure we know where everything goes so we have it written down so when we need something we know where it is. After the long five days in Padang, of organizing and getting everything together. It was quite emotional watching everyone work so hard. Our mission that we're doing right now is just completely insane. I, I'm so overwhelmed on what's going on. I'm looking out over this vessel that's about to go out into the, the damaged corners of the Indian Ocean with all this incredible amount of what they call material that's going to really help people, you know, and some of it's food and some of it's things like blackboards for their schools. And to, to know that in the farthest reaches, the, the areas that have been totally ignored by the Red Cross and everyone else coming in, the, the devastated corners of the outer islands like Simulu, and that if, if this is going to be the first aid vessel to reach it, it's just, I'm going to cry. After he helped plan and fund our mission, Bill opted to stay behind to run the operation from the ground. We are the only vessel carrying live livestock to, to re-propagate the, the areas because of Timmy Turner. <laughs> We're getting on the boat right now, you know, just loading up our gear. <laughs> like, we loaded up everything, our supplies. Now we're just loading our gear and getting ready to sail off. Our paths will cross again. <laughs> Just before dawn, the Makumba sealed off into the dark. I couldn't sleep much that morning, so I went to the top deck where I found one of the Indonesian doctors, Uul, praying to her God. Later she told me that her prayer was for our mission and the safety of her group. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna save this chicken's life by putting them with the goats because those chickens over there have been pecking this poor chicken's head off. So let me put them inside here. Go ahead, chicken. We are not killing these goats. We're gonna what's it called? Bring them to a village that has been completely wiped out and. Uh, let them reproduce. So these goats have another five years to live. There's two females and one male. And what that means is the male gets to hump both of them. And uh, each female gets jealous. And, the, and so that just makes them want to hump more. So we're bringing this to a village to reproduce goats. We figured out that there's a cat on board. This baby cat came on board, and uh, we didn't even know about it. I think I think her name's a fugitive. We have called her because she's a she's a runaway. She's a castaway, or she needs some food. <laughs> We've been force feeding her all day and giving her water and stuff. Uh, she's she's pretty sweet. It's been a decent day. Everybody's just been pretty relaxed, getting the boat organized. The doctors have gone through and and. Uh, you know, make sure all their supplies are good. As we were sailing deep into the Indian Ocean, we spotted something on the horizon. As we got closer, we noticed it was someone's attempt at making a raft. This was our first sign from the destruction of the tsunami. We knew that we were getting closer to our destination. Later, with no land in sight, we crossed the equator. 
you'll never, you'll never crash that one. We hit the equator, yeah, we're dread center at the equator, and we finally get to jump in the ocean. Okay, so, so I'm it's so great. Well, I had to cut loose the dinghy that was sinking, the USS Timmy Turner here, as you can see behind me. She had some holes in it and was sinking. She was holding up our mission, so we had to send her out on her own. All we were left with was a small inflatable dinghy to get our supplies into the beach. The captain he says we have 45 hours total, or 44 hours. So it looks like we'll be getting there tomorrow sometime. Or maybe, I don't even know, it might take another day, two days. But our first destination is uh, the capital of Nias. off the island of Nias in the harbor of Cagoon Satoli. Like, God, if people really still need stuff at this late of date, then they gotta be hurting, so. I don't know, apparently there's a little mafia thing going on in here, and uh, we gotta kind of fly under the radar, which is, seems kind of hard with that big boat. When we reached the shore, everything had such a strange vibe to it. We discovered it was because the black market was up and running. A lot of the aid supplies that were pouring in were being warehoused so that they could be sold later. When we refused to unload anything, things got pretty tense. It wasn't until the vice governor showed up and clarified this ugly situation. Our journey to Nias wasn't a total waste because we ended up meeting an Australian doctor named Melissa. She joined a group as we headed to North Sumatra. We're going to Alifan, and lots of refugees have come to Aceh into Similu, into Alifan. So we need to go there and supply them with some food. We're about right here on the chart now. We're going to be turning to starboard soon and headed up through here and then all the way to points beyond. So I wish we were moving more quickly, but that can't be helped, not with a boat this heavily laden. And they have something in Indonesian, the word sabara, and it means patience. We'll get there. Mara and Alyssa went to the beach. We see Mara and Alyssa waving. They're just going, waving their hands. And we didn't think nothing of it, but we went to the beach and there we saw a dead body. It wasn't just a dead body, it was a skull. It wasn't really scary because it looked like Pirates of the Caribbean. It looked like the ride, you know, in Disneyland. And he was all by himself, and it looked like a good place, you know, to be buried. We continued sailing north into the unprotected waters of the Indian Ocean to the island of Simla. The Makumba anchored in Labuana Bay, which is 22 miles from the epicenter. We found a village that actually hasn't been aided yet, 95% wiped out. Um, they've all the people ran up into the hills, their village is pretty much wiped out, and they desperately need aid, uh, food, building supplies, water, all the things that we have they need. And um, looks like we found our little niche because uh, it's exactly what we've been looking for. We offloaded our supplies onto smaller fishing boats, which didn't get damaged by the tsunami. Right now, we're offloading all the emergency stuff we need right away. The baby food, the medical supplies, salt, sugar, dried fish, uh, and of course the emergency buckets. We decided to give our goats away to this village so they could start breeding.
We were all a little nervous as we had no idea what to expect. I remember having butterflies in my stomach. We're now just coming into our uh, village that we are trying to help here in the Oliphon province of Similu. It's the most northernmost point of the Sumatran Islands. We are directly across from Banda Aceh, which is why we've been seeing some bodies in the channel. It's been pretty grim. You can see the people lining up in anticipation. It looks like there's maybe two to three hundred people here. This one's really remote. We're just going to set up on the beach with some impromptu tents. We're getting our medical uh, team in their little tent, and we're going to be um, distributing all these different rescue kits to the rest of the families. We're the very first people to get here. Um, you gave them the goats. They're psyched. You see your goats? I just saw them running around. They're so stoked. There was this little boy in the village that we gave our cat to. We knew that we couldn't take care of it in the future, so this was the best thing that we could have done for it. Everyone in the village gave a helping hand as we unloaded the boat. The supplies were then carried to our distribution tents. The head of the village had a list of every family's name, and one by one, their name would be called to pick up their aid bucket. <laughs> After each family would receive their supplies, they'd walk back in the jungle through a path of destruction. We had all the injured villagers line up by the medical tent. I don't know what we would have done without Mara. Since she spoke the local language, she was able to communicate with the people and control the lines. Mara would write down the people's names, age, and symptoms so the doctors knew if they were injured or sick. This old man came to us with a broken collarbone. He was running from the tsunami when he tripped and fell. He hasn't been able to walk since this happened. He cannot walk right now since the tsunami hit, so we want to check. Somebody take him from the hill with this thing. His friends had pushed him in on a wheelbarrow from the hills as he remained on high ground since the tsunami. Watching the doctors work was pretty amazing. Whatever the victims brought, they had to deal with in a very relaxed manner. They seemed to put themselves in crazy situations. This is the biggest liver I've ever seen. Normally, it is about 12 centimeters. This would be about 30 centimeters. He has active tuberculosis. Today was incredible, and it's what makes it all worth it. All the effort and everything it's a big reward when you get to help a lot of people like that. As the doctors continued working, the head of the village cut up our watermelon and passed out the fruit. I started thinking about home and how much we take for granted. Watching everyone come back for seconds and thirds with some of the biggest smiles on their faces. After we passed out the fruit, we set up a volleyball net for the kids. We also brought a soccer ball and had a surfboard for them to ride. As the day went on, patients kept coming into the hospital clinic. We've taken a sort of a dramatic turn of events here. Our doctors volunteered to stay on land through the night, treating the people that need help. There's a lot of injured people. It's very, very dangerous because of the uh, malaria in this area, but I couldn't talk them out of it. 
We're trying to do a doctor's clinic. We don't have any mattresses, we only have one stethoscope and we don't have enough light. And there's mosquitoes, but we're doing the best we can. This little baby has little bites on him and some kind of eye infection. His grandfather came in with a huge gash on his shin. The cut was really infected and hasn't been cleaned out since the tsunami. This hasn't formed a proper scab and it'll probably cause sepsis in the blood. So we need to remove the scab, give it air and totally anesthetize it as well as uh, put antiseptic on it. Yeah, I think... He's told us that um, the bone was sticking out when he had the big wound, so that means he's got a bone infection. This is even hard to cure in the Western world. So we're going to give him a load of antibiotics and cover up his wound and hope for the best. Huh? Local anaesthetic? Is that what you're going to ask? What is it? Just like the old man, there was this young boy who came into the clinic with cuts all over his feet. Since a couple of weeks had passed, these cuts got really infected, and if left untreated, he could have faced amputation. The cries from this boy sent shivers down our spines. Before we knew it, the doctors had treated all the patients. Finally, it's finished, yeah. But hari ini begitu berbeda. Kita bekerja keras supaya semua pasien dapat kita layani dengan baik, walaupun dalam kondisi yang sangat memperhatinkan saya pikir ya tapi semuanya kita bekerja dengan sekuat tenaga dengan gembira dengan senang dan semuanya selesai dengan selamat oke okay. oh, I am feel great I feel just great <laughs> need more eh huh? you see my face <laughs> the day ended around two in the morning and we started to head back to the fishing boat that was going to take us to the Makumba as we approached our boat we could hear sounds of the crew singing and playing the guitar. There's such a peaceful and relaxing feeling. We all just sat around and thought of the day. Life is just about perfect right now. This is the times, these are the times in life on a boat when throughout history and time honored, and the crew is relaxing after a hard day of work and a sort of plaintive sound of music can be heard from the crew. And everybody knows that all is well. <laughs> We were sailing in the area of the only surf camp in all of Simulu. We decided to stop in for some rest and figure out our next move. When the tsunami hit, we were in Australia, we were visiting family. So as soon as we heard, we got straight back here. What did you find when you got back? Were well, you worried about your house? Yeah, sure, we were worried about our house, but we are more worried about the people. Yeah? We've got workers here. 
and the people that live here, you know. Obviously, we fought the worst. We fought the whole place to be wiped out. But uh, luckily, the people, they know to run to the hills, so, they, you know, not many casualties. But uh, most of the houses are gone. I was amazed how the minimal damage here, you know. So, yeah, we're stoked. We're very happy. No one died here, and the house is still standing. So, yeah, it's unbelievable. But you lost a lot of family members, huh, Bondi out there? Yeah, we've lost two families from my wife's side, two close families, yeah. Still people missing, houses totally gone. So yeah, it's pretty devastating. We had a meeting with the local officials. He explained to Mira where the villages were that needed aid. They were 95 percent damaged, no houses, nothing. They need the mosquito uh, nets, but yeah. we don't have it. We cannot find it, but we can find mosquito and lotion. Uh -huh. And then that's it. Okay, so here's how I see it. We're sailing north now, yeah. as yeah. soon as possible, yeah. right? Yes. For, set sail for yeah. Alabon. How long does it take to get there? Knows the area, all the local knowledge. And he's saying it's too dangerous to go on the west coast here. There's so many, there's a lot of offshore reefs, offshore waves. It's not, it's dangerous. So we're gonna get a safe way and we'll travel through the night up to the top. It's okay. in the morning. It's the long way, but it's a safe way. Do they know if there's many sick people there? Uh, he say not yet, but they don't have like a life, nothing. I mean, their house is completely wiped out. So I think there is so many good uses. But then I met the, the head of the district. Mm -hmm. We're going to coordinate with the doctor there. Good. And you, can, you guys can tell what's going on there. We packed up and sailed north. That night, we celebrated Dustin's 30th birthday on the Makumba. <laughs> What can I say? 30. Couldn't think of a better place to spend my 30th birthday. <laughs> Honestly, uh, birthdays haven't always been the best time for me, but this is definitely the best birthday I've ever had. And I want to thank my best friend Timmy for following me on another one of my weird, crazy ideas. <laughs> Leaving his, his wife and, and all that and, and coming out here and doing this. And I just, everybody, like, like as a team, like, just as a group and as friends, like, really all came together and that's what I think makes it most special, you know? Because we're all out here because we wanted to be out here and that's, that's special for me, you know? Like, that's, that's super special. When we arrived to the village of Latahara, we realized that we couldn't reach the shore because the reef was completely exposed from the earthquake. The devastating effects of the earthquake caused the reef to raise three meters above the ocean surface. This was an incredible force in nature to have witnessed. We've got to somehow find another entry to this uh, village. There is no way I'm sending people in through that razor sharp reef. There's just no way. We then sailed around the bend and found an open path to the shore. Mira and Matt went to the beach to assess the situation. They were trying to find local fishing boats to help transport our supplies to the beach. Mira would find the head of the village. She would find out how many families there were so we knew how much supplies need to come off the boat. I got a little impatient and decided to tie three surfboards together with shovels and tarps on it. I wanted to get these supplies to the beach and start working. Right now, Timmy's just brought in the first uh, small bit of supplies, tarps and shovels to set up those areas. And um, supposedly we have a bigger boat coming out 
so we can start offloading all this um, aid supply, everything we got. Once they found a fishing boat, the boat came out to the Makumba, and we started unloading our supplies onto it. Okay, here's what's happening. We're going to offload, as I said, the first thing you can start working on is produce and fruit. Fruit, yes, it's on this side. My mom was in charge of everything that went off the boat. There is... Hey, did we get that sugar on board? Yes, we did. Um, there is 30, there's 10 big bags and there's 35 pad, pads in one bag. Uh, one comes with more tools and axe, a saw and everything a and a uh, hammer. Yes. And they want you to um, fill up a, a bag full of stuff. Not too much, but enough to get, to get by. So we'll just cover um, dehydration and malnutrition and take a little bit of amoxicillin. Yes. Before we knew it, the boat was on shore and we had all the help we needed. No one has been in here. These people have nothing. You can see the devastation that has happened here. The wave was approximately, by these estimation, almost to the top of these palm trees. That would make it about a 50-foot surge of water. It was hard to believe that our supplies were reaching an end. Watching the faces of these men made me think of all the other villages out there that wouldn't receive any help. This is our medical tent, and uh, we're gonna set up a little, a little uh, medical area over here so our doctors, our four doctors, can work. Um, apparently, there's people that are pretty sick. We're making a list of the worst to not so bad and, and getting the worst wounded in right now. We seem to have an outbreak of tuberculosis in this village. Um, this can be very dangerous. In any Western country, we would notify the public health department over this and they would have to be quarantined. All we can do in this situation is give them face masks and hope they don't spread it to their children and the other elders. So this is what we're doing for everyone here. They cough blood for a long time and have this chronic, awful, awful sounding breathing. Bisa diceritain waktu tsunami itu, Pak? Bisa. Waktu kejadian tsunami, kami memang waktu itu uh, sebagian ada yang berpergian, juga sebagian ada di tempat. Uh, kemudian pas tiba-tiba sekitar jam 8 pagi, uh, tiba gempa yang begitu dahsyatnya kan, habis rumah-rumah rum perbah. massive destruction this was a total town you can see it like this is this was a town there's a house and bicycles and I don't know what to say I'm a little bit uh, spun out at the moment <laughs> sort of seen plenty of footage of all this stuff when you see a village absolutely leveled and people walking around there's a shoe here there's a filing cabinet there in that part of the village up there I saw a school book kind of lying on the ground just open it a kids homework but it's, Gnarly. It's all been said, I guess, but until you actually see it, it doesn't really hit home. Masuk airnya waktu pertama digoncang, baru surut air. Sudah surut air, sikit tengah jam, lari ke atas gunung. Sudah lari ke atas gunung, baru datang air. Sampai segini dalamnya, pokoknya. Besar airnya, masuk. Every day. Dustin would set up the sat phone to send back photos and daily journals. We're ready for send off. He was able to send information on how our progress was going.
Meanwhile, back at the medical tent, patients are still waiting for their name to be called to see the doctors. The doctors would rotate their jobs throughout the day. Sometimes they would be treating the patients when the others would be filling out their prescriptions. But before we knew it, this burnt baby was hiked in from another village. He was burned earlier that morning because of the conditions that they were living in. The baby had pulled down a pot of hot cooking oil. This little boy is really, really badly burnt, at least 50% over his body, which means he's going to get hypovolemia and severely dehydrated. He's also at greater risk of getting really bad infections, such as staph. And with all the debris and things around here and feces lying around, he's, yeah, not going to be well unless we fix him now. This baby was so badly burnt that the doctors stopped everything that they were doing and focused in on him. We're making sure that the baby breastfeeds because that's the best form of rehydration. Um, has all the proteins and minerals and vitamins that the baby needs. When a baby gets burnt, they have less surface area, so they are in a lot more danger of getting dehydrated. So at the moment, we are cutting off all the excess skin to prevent it from keeping the dirt in, and we're washing it with betadine. We will then put on some antiseptic and antibiotic cream. And have they got a bucket coming to wash the baby? A bucket. I think it would have been pretty hard for that little boy to live, to be honest. We were lucky we got there on the day it actually happened, because he only got burnt in the morning. So, yeah, he would not have had a good prognosis. Later that evening, a military ship showed up. These waters are highly restricted from Western boats because of the Civil War in Bondi Aceh. The commanders boarded the Makumba and began interrogating us. Yes. Our batteries are all dead. We're charging it now. I'm not getting the radio right now. Go to we all stood back and tried to cooperate as best as we could. It wasn't until Mira explained to them our mission and what we were doing, and they were able to understand that we were here to help. Finally, the captains thanked us for helping their people. We watched the Navy ship unload their supplies, and what they have brought was hundreds and hundreds of boxes of packaged noodles. So we were glad we brought fruit, doctors, and medicine to these people. We found a village to donate all of our money that we gathered from home. The money would be used to rebuild their mosque, which had cracks in the walls. This was very unsafe for them to worship in. Also, their community center had collapsed from the earthquake. We even had extra supplies that we unloaded from the boat. There's more than 18,000 islands in Indonesia. We were only able to visit a few that were affected by the tsunami. When Dust and I first decided to come over here, we had no idea of what we were getting ourselves into. We also prevent disease, so every time before you eat, make sure you wash your hands. If you've been in the water... Some of these villages had never even seen Western people in their life. Um, and what really struck me was that they'd had the biggest devastation the world has ever seen, but the little kids could still smile, and they'd lost absolutely everything, but they smiled for us. I always say that smile of people that we've been helped is no money can buy. I think that's, yes, we are here because of love, right? And we have become a family. Having my mom there was a true blessing. She bonded with the Indonesian doctors like they were her family. I could just give money, but I didn't want to give just money. I wanted to help whoever needed help. That's what life is about. And that's what we kind of did. We all went over there and met up with each other and went out to these islands and helped. This trip was truly amazing, to meet new people that I never met before. And spending more than a week on a boat with them was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. People 
of any creed, of any color, of any religion, if you come together as a family and you work together, you can really make a difference. It was just really good that we they were using our tarps to rebuild their houses and I got to see the impact of even just a little bit of help and, and the difference it can make. That's all we can do is try and do what we can and help a little bit. It's a drop in the ocean but every drop helps and ultimately it's drops that fill buckets. It was crazy how all of us randomly came together by fate to accomplish everything we did with no previous relief aid training. Our plan fell right into place and everything got dispersed to just the right people. I saw so many smiles and grateful faces and I felt like I had given at least a little of what this country has given to me in the last eight years. Before we all went our separate ways, we piled into a bima and headed to the beach. Dr. Ool and Dr. Wati begged us to teach them how to surf. They said they wanted to learn ever since they found out that we were surfers. Never seen someone so determined to learn how to surf. Watching Dr. Ool and Dr. Wati in the water with their traditional Muslim head coverings is something that I will never forget. Every time they fall off the board, they would climb back up and have us pull them back onto another wave. I feel great. I feel I have to defeat it, you know? I best. I'm very best. I can stand up like this. Bye. I finally got to do something that I wanted to do for a long time, and that was take my mom surfing. 